Thank you for doing this. Oh, no worries, man. Thanks for taking the time. Absolutely. Uh, this is an absolute thrill for me. Uh, I am a big fan of yours. So when I heard that movies was coming to Toronto, I was over the moon because my first experience with your work was actually at Clerks 2, which I know is like a weird way to start, but then I got to go back and experience the whole thing. So for this, this is like a dream come true for myself and obviously big fans of your work. And I know you did this already in Chicago. So I was just hoping that maybe you can get into how was it received in Chicago? What can we look forward to it being here uh, in the Tobacco and the Queensway? And of course it's open today. So what do we have to look forward to? Uh, we got lucky in as much as at the beginning of the pandemic out here in uh, California, um, Derek Barry, who's done a series of pop-up restaurants, had a slot open up because Clueless was going to do a 25th anniversary pop-up restaurant, but they dropped out. So he was going to have to let go of his staff and all that stuff. And then he was like, wait, you got a fake fast food joint in, in the movies, right? I was like, yeah, movies. He's like, can we do that? And I'd always dreamed, like, you know, from the first moment we shot Dogma, the scene for movies and Dogma, I was like, man, it'd be amazing if somebody did this one day, like just made this a real fast food joint. And so suddenly this opportunity popped up. I was like, let's go for it. And it went really well out here in West Hollywood. Then there was a restaurant in New Jersey called Gianni's a pizza place. And they were like, can we do it out here? And we'd never thought about going beyond here. So we were like, all right, let's try it back home, which it went very well. Cause that's where we come from and stuff. Then we just did it in Chicago last week and that killed and stuff. And Stuart uh, Pollock, who's our uh, uh, licensing guy, um, he lives right up there in Toronto and stuff. So from the beginning, you know, once we went to Johnny's, he's like, maybe this is something we could bring to Toronto. I was like, I would love that. Are you kidding me? Cause I yeah. love Canada anyway. And then be able to eat movies in Toronto and like to eat movies where Degrassi is would be pretty amazing. So <laughs> he started working on it and he found uh, like partners with kitchen hub. They were like, let's do it. And they reskin their joint. Um, and so we opened today and then people could pop by, take pictures and stuff. There's artwork all over the joint and then skip the dishes is our other partner. And they start delivering, I think next week or something like that. Yeah. So then you don't even have to go into the place. You could just have it delivered to home because, you know, some people don't want to go out because it's all COVID out there and stuff. Yeah, not yeah. really as much up there as it is down here for heaven's sakes, which is why we're not there. Like me and Jay have gone to the opening of the movies, pop ups in the States, but we we can't get up there without giving up like four weeks. <laughs> You'll have to come back when everything's a little bit loosened so you can experience it. I'm waiting for it. The moment they said like the other day, Pfizer was like, we got, you know, 90% efic efficacy or whatever like that. Yeah. All I could think was like, that's, that's 90% closer to going back to Canada for me. <laughs> you talk about all the artwork that's in the restaurants and I know there's probably a ton of references in it. So uh, for big fans of you, are they going to walk in and just be like, oh, my God, this is everything I ever dreamed of it? I, I think if you don't know anything about Kevin Smith movies, you'll enjoy the food. But if you know the movies we've made, yeah, there's like anything you walk past. There's a I assure you we're open sign. There's a quick stop. Sign. Um, there's like a you could take a picture with like there's Jay and I on the wall and whatnot. Uh, and of course, the movies logos everywhere. So it is kind of like a little bit like stepping into the flicks, even more so once you look at the menu board, because that's when you can like order a cow tipper, which is a sandwich we had in the movies, or my yeah. favorite, cock smoker, which was in James <laughs> Alabama's boot, hater tots as well. So we keep like uh, the menu from the movies and bring it into real life. For Toronto, we always try to put a locally themed dish and naturally poutine came to mind. Amazing. So we have moutine uh, as well, <laughs> which is, you know, it, it, for me, I never saw, you know, being a restaurateur in the cards uh, whatsoever. <laughs> but this is a beautiful way to do it because it's not like, you know, you're putting down brick and mortar roots and going like, we're investing and we want to be open for forever and whatnot. Yeah. It, it goes until people are disinterested and then you move on to something else. But the nice thing about a kitchen hub in Canada is that if it works, this first one in Toronto, we get to spread out. Like I know we go as far as Hamilton and then maybe we start going out into the other provinces. That would be mind bending. Eventually like now, take over McDonald's. I, I mean, I don't even want that, man. And like, <laughs> like if I could have 0.1% of Tio's share up there, that'd be astounding. <laughs> but I mean, as long as they keep popping them up across the provinces, because as soon as we announce like it's coming to Toronto, 
everybody in Vancouver was like, you jerk, you went to school here. So <laughs> I, I, I got to get West as yeah, well. It sounds a lot like Vancouver. Is there, a, is there a donkey within movies or is that something that probably health code violation? We, because of COVID, there will be no donkey on the premises at, at <laughs> Kitchen Hub. But uh, as soon as restrictions are lifted, you can, be, bet, you can bet that there'll be ass. There'll be <laughs> <laughs> so you have some of the most quotable movies ever. And I have to ask, is that almost exhausting for you? Because there's so many great big quotes that I'm sure people come up to you on the street and say, but there's also like the really deep cut references. And do you find like, Sometimes you're forgetting references to your own work. Does that happen for you? Never in a million years. I, I remember yeah. every word that I've written and whatnot, but I love the quotable dialogue stuff because long before I made films, that was how I talked to my friends. We spoke in strictly in animal house dialogue, raising Arizona dialogue. So it was nice when I started hearing people reference my dialogue. Cause I was like, I know what that feels like. I know what that yeah. means. Um, it, yeah, over the years, somebody hit me with a quote the other day where I was like, it's a crazy deep cuts quote from clerks. Wasn't one like, I'm not even supposed to be here today. It was something way down the list or something. And um, it always blows my mind, the things that people zero in on. Yeah. Um, but as a wordsmith, as somebody who like fancied himself a writer first and foremost, that means the most to me. Because that means like I've infected those others with my word virus. Yeah, it's got to be the equivalent of like when a, a rock star is standing on stage and people are singing back the lyrics, right? I mean, no, because that cat, like that, you're a god, you know, yeah. that moment in time when you've got like 10,000, 100,000 people screaming back at you and singing your song. You know, I get dudes who look like me coming up to me and going, I'm not even supposed to be here today. And, and that's <laughs> beautiful, don't get me wrong, but it's not standing in front of the multitude <laughs> to turn you into a rock god for that moment in time. But as far as screenwriters go, it's pretty damn close. So Kevin, I want to circle back to something you just talked about, about growing up with your friends and how you guys would just talk in movie quotes. And, and you are, and this is not an exaggeration of me blowing smoke, one, one of my favorite storytellers on the planet. And I'm not just talking about like your movies and your podcasts, but like even your work on your evening lists, I just absolutely devour those. Thank and you. I want to know, it, were you, I know that growing up, you were the funny one in your friend group and, and I'm sure that played a huge part in learning to tell stories, but, and of course your love of film, but was there someone in your family that like, that was just a really good storyteller that you, you found, you kind of picked up on what they were doing? I mean, it's just first, something that came naturally. First, uh, I'll be honest with you. Like I was not the funny one in my friend group. Um, I could be humorous and stuff, but like the class clown, like Jay was a class clown type. Yeah. Um, and Jeff Anderson, oddly enough, the guy who played Randall in Clerks, he was also a, a more subdued class clown, but he always had, like, he was bold enough to say things out loud. You know, I had a sense of humor and I wrote sketches for the talent show and stuff like that, but I never considered myself, like, myself funny. I, I thought I could write funny things. That was my dream. I wanted to write for Saturday Night Live. So when I wrote clerks like i've been writing for 10 years just various stories and stuff as a kid i got a hold of an electric typewriter so i started doing that stuff early and we didn't have cable tv or the internet so this was a way where you can make your own entertainment so to speak and whatnot and so by the time i sat down and wrote the script for clerks you know i was kind of well trained to be like set up punchline and here's some funny insights and i'd worked at convenience stores for like almost 10 years at that point yeah. So I had enough material to draw from. And then because of the movie, like you go to film festivals and at film festivals and the movies done, they're like, get up there and talk about the movie. And I couldn't get up there and wax erudite because like I'd made one movie by, it was all spit and glue. So I wasn't going to sit up there and like hold forth like Quentin Tarantino. So I figured like at least make it entertaining, try to be as entertaining as possible and stuff. Like you know, they put a mic in your hand. In my world, that means go be funny. And so I would just try to do that and lean more into um, like kind of being funny. And I've been a big stand up comic fan my whole life and tried it like once for like a 10 minute set. But like if the only other time I'd been on stage as myself, like trying to work an audience was that one time at like rascals comedy club i went to an open mic night and i'd had stage experience being in plays and stuff in high school but that was it and suddenly this world the world of film 
afforded me this, and this is going to sound sexier than I mean it, like a backdoor entry into standing up and talking. And, and even at the beginning, people would be like, wow, it's like you're doing stand up. And I was like, no, man, a stand up comic. I have such reverence for stand up comic. Yeah. I was like, a stand up comic comes in and like, you don't need to know anybody in the room and they don't need to know anything about that comic. They just start generating and making the audience laugh. I was like, I need somebody to ask me a question then I could tell them a funny story about how we made the movies. So it, it they kind of started going hand in hand, like Clerks as a you know movie, but as a screenplay made people go, oh, he's kind of clever. And then being out there with the movie on the festival circuit, like you got real time response, not just to like people watching the movie. I sat in the back and listened to people laugh at the movie and felt good. But then I would try to beat the movie afterwards during the q and I was like, let me see if I can be funnier than the movie. And suddenly you're competing <laughs> with your own work, trying to be like, well, yeah, that was all right. But like, that was me last year. Like, I, I know how to work this crowd. So the two of them kind of grew together. And, and it, it took me years to believe that like I was funny you know i always thought like oh i'm witty or i'm clever or something yeah. like that and, and i would never people would be like i do q a's all the time where i'd go do theaters i did a lot of colleges and whatnot my, my crowning achievement was like i sold out carnegie hall and during like 10 years of like doing q a's and evening with kevin smith and stuff like that like they would hit me up about going to comedy clubs now mind you i'm playing like thousand seat theaters and stuff comedy clubs you only have to sell out 200 seats but I wouldn't do it because a comedy club to me was like a shrine, like a temple, like the way, uh, you know, some people feel about Maple Leaf Gardens and stuff. Yeah, you know, it just it's a, a, a holy place that only people who are truly gifted at this form should take the stage. So I always stayed away from comedy clubs until podcasting, until I started doing podcasting, because then me and Ralph were doing this Hollywood Babylon podcast, me and my friend Ralph Garman, and Jason and I, Jason Muse, were doing Jay and Silent Bob Get Old. And those were two live shows that we started in front of crowds. Like first it was my own little club, uh, Smod Castle, a podcasting yeah. theater. And then like it became clear that like this theater is too small, it's only 50 seater. So we started going out into the world. We went to the John Lovitz Comedy Club and then wound up at the Improv and stuff. And then the business grew out from there. And for some reason, like then I felt confident about going to a comedy club because I wasn't alone. I was going to be sitting next to a friend talking to each other. So there was a, a safety net. And it was a yeah. weird proposition to at first try to explain to comedy clubs like because I've been podcasting since 2007. So I've been in it for like 13 years. So like when I, we started hitting, I was known as a like a Q and A act where you know I go out on the road and answer questions, but when we tried to book podcasts like at the comedy clubs, they'd be like, "What is it?" And I'm like, "Well, we, me and my friends sit down, we talk to each other," and they're like, "You don't stand up?" We're like, "No, we sit down." <laughs> like you don't talk to the crowd? Like no, we talk to each other, and then we record the whole thing, and they're like, "Why?" So you had to explain this thing to them. Now it's like everywhere and stuff. But that was got. That's what gave me the confidence to go into a comedy club. Some sitting next to somebody, particularly Ralph Garman, who was like on the radio, like yourself, uh, in K on K Rock every morning in Los yeah. Angeles. So he was the funny guy on his show. That that made me feel like, all right, now I can def I could deflect and defer to like, look, maybe I don't belong here, but this funny guy does. So I'm going to attach myself to him, like Ed McMahon or something like that. He's almost so, got his hand but, on your I, shoulder, being like, this guy's cool. Very much so. So yeah. honestly, like I, I, I like to believe I'm funny, but I'm also a creature of the internet. So I've had many strangers tell me how not. <laughs> funny. But like, I remember the first time I saw it, like you know, in the beginning of my career, there would be like filmmaker or director Kevin Smith. The first time somebody like introed me or on on the Chiron at the bottom of a TV show, it said comedian Kevin Smith. That was when I felt like, all right, somebody else said it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never said it, and so that counts. But I, I always feel guilty when it comes to like my stand-up because, unlike most, unlike real comics, who have to go up and create five minutes and build it out and and put in stage time and hope that they get more stage time, I came in through the back door because a film like I could spend time talking about that. And that's interesting to people going, oh my God, he's made a movie and stuff. And I get material out of it and stuff. So 
I've always felt like kind of bad. I didn't have to pay my dues, so to yeah. speak. Like never, like you talk to a lot of comics or if you know a lot of comics, you know, they're tortured souls, a lot of yes. them. And I haven't really been tortured. Like a lot of them jockey for position to get on stage. I've never really had to compete and stuff. And so that was another reason I always felt hesitant about going into a comedy club because I thought they would be like, you faker, you know, you phony. Like we're, we're real <laughs> comics and you're this yeah. guy who makes silly movies. So it's taken a long time. I've been doing my job like in total for 26 years now at this point. Clerks came out in 94, so it's been 26 years. And that whole time, I've been quietly building like a comedy career that as the film career got less loud, the comedy career got more loud. So I, I could stop going like, oh, I'm a director. And I could start being like, oh, I'm Kevin Smith. So that includes directing, but yeah. it also includes comedy and podcasting, writing comics. It's like spin a lot of plates so they can't nail you down for the one thing because they can let they can stop giving you money to make movies. They can't stop you from making movies as long as you can find your own money to do it. But the institutions that like give out the big bucks, they can totally stop giving you fuck giving you money to, to spend. So at that point, you definitely want to be able to pivot to something else. Like when Mallrats came out in 95, died. Like everyone loves that movie now, but when it came out, it flopped and took my career down with it. And I would have been finished, man, were it not for like Chasing Amy, which was a quick pivot of 250,000 bucks. And it said something and people were like, all right, he's back on track. <laughs> but like Mallrats almost killed me and swamped my boat. And that was scary because I was like, I never want my future to be in somebody else's hands again like that, where I feel like I might not get another job. So I've always quietly or, or loudly developed the side gig of like, I, you know, it's fun to make movies and that's what I'm primarily known for. But my favorite part of the job is just going somewhere on a stage and talking about how we made that movie. So I get the hit of creating the art form itself and then the double hit of like talking about it for a while. And I noticed most other filmmakers like a David Fincher, he don't spend like, he, he don't even talk about like seven no more or fight <laughs> club. He's always in the present or in the future. But like, I'm still talking about clerks, mall rats and stuff like that because so much of my process isn't just making the movie. A lot of filmmakers make the movie and the movie could speak for itself. My process is I make for them, I make the movie. And then when the movie's done, I come out and go like, hold on, let me explain what happened. Me and Bruce Willis were fighting and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Movie for me just keeps going. Like it's, it doesn't end when the credits end with my audience. Thank God they're, they're patient and tolerant enough to sit there and listen to me. I could keep the experience going by telling them the story of how it got made, which in many cases is more interesting than the actual movie itself. Well, Kevin, I, I know it's early there for you, and I, I could sincerely talk to you all morning. This is an absolute thrill for me. Uh, so thank you. It's a pleasure, man. In a world that where I'm getting up early, what a great conversation to have. This was so much fun. Thank you. And once again, Movies is opening at 9.35, the Queensway. The Tobacco opens today, and like you mentioned, it's going to be on Skip the Dishes starting on November 26th, running to December 2. So get the get Movies in you, and if you haven't watched any Kevin Smith's movies, what are you doing with your life? Figure it out. But Kevin, Absolutely. thank you so much for this.